Yeah, I need the clicker. Ah, yeah. So it's the one with the forward arrow on it, obviously. Yes. Forward. Yes, Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, uh, to see uh, this particular workshop. Um, and thank you for allowing me to speak in English. Uh, it, it really is best uh, because my, uh, my, my, my Dutch, I, I really won't get very far uh, at all. Um, this is meant to be a workshop. Now, I don't know what people normally think workshops are. Um, and, uh, but I prepared a presentation. Uh, but I think because it's a workshop, please interrupt and ask questions as we go. And if I'm talking too fast, please let me know as well and we'll try and make, make sure everything is clear. Uh, but it'd be very good if, if uh, you know, there's a little bit of dialogue rather than, you know, I'll, I'll bore you very quickly, uh, I think, if it's just, just me talking. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jim Glockley, I'm the Technical Director of the Fire Protection Association uh, in the UK. Uh, our background, our history is really set in the UK insurance industry, and so with that, most of the, our undertakings are to do with business and property protection uh, and resilience. Uh, in the UK, life safety is taken care of by, by the government, um, but uh, above that, no additional measures are mandated in the UK. It's the same, same in Holland. Right, we find, uh, talking from an insurer's perspective, we find this situation uh, quite ridiculous um, <coughs> and is certainly leading us down to a path of buildings which are very vulnerable to fire. If your only measure is people being out of the building before it collapses, uh, there is no, uh, uh, there, there's no emphasis on uh, dealing with the fire, putting it out, uh, recovering the, the building and recovering the business. Uh, that's all left to being sort of totally uh, voluntary and it requires you know, quite enlightened people in the shape of the management of a company uh, to understand that it, it, it's like this. Uh, and, but insurers provide a, a lot of support uh, in this. Um, what I've been asked to talk about today is some of the research initiatives uh, that we pursue. My major funders are the insurance industries and, and UK military, uh, both who have a big interest in, in preserving property and, and business or, or mission, uh, if you like. So it fits very well together. Uh, the, um, that's just a little bit about us. Um, but the, what I'd like to talk about is uh, insurers like to understand fire and rescue service response. They like to know um, what they're prepared to do and the likely benefit uh, that, that can be expected from them. And this comes into two things that they do. It, it obviously plays a, a small part in how they set insurance premiums. Uh, I myself, I live in a, a thatched house, so I have a straw roof on my house in a very remo remote part of the UK. Uh, trying to get fire and rescue services there in a meaningful time is totally impossible. And it's important for my insurer to know that, so that they can charge me uh, every month what most people pay in a year uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to insure their house. Uh, but it's, 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 good, it's good business. The more important bit, though, uh, is to help the insurer provide good risk, um, risk control to their customer. Too many people in the UK, too many businesses and people assume that the level of cover um, from the fire and rescue service will be uniform and instantaneous and absolutely capable. But it's not the case. And um, you know, some people like myself live in remote areas, uh, but certainly with businesses, it depends how they build their buildings, what they build out of, the nature of the work going on. When you actually do the analysis, um, actually the, the fire and rescue service can, can never cover um, the job that needs to be done in the event of a fire. And so to make the customer aware of this, to provide the tools to help them understand this, um, enables the insurer to open up conversations about being a bit more self-sufficient, uh, provide sprinklers, practice good risk control, uh, and, and good business continuity practice uh, that will keep their business surviving. But too many people assume that uh, always the fire and rescue services will turn up uh, like a white knight and save the day for them. Uh, but it's, it's less like that now. So uh, the two, really the two key topic areas I'd like to talk about are understanding fire and rescue service response in the UK 
Um, and I'm, I, it will be very UK-centric, and I, I hope it's still meaningful uh, to, to what you do. Um, but also um, the technologies that we help to promote uh, that will help support a timely response to speed things up a little. Uh, and I'd like to talk about high integrity uh, detection uh, and new tools and methods. I know many that you're looking at, uh, like cutting extinguishing systems, uh, which can help with the speed of intervention. And so that's what I'm just like to discuss. So understanding fire and rescue service response. What we try to, we, we try to look sort of through the entire life of things and describe to the insurer what it takes to get a fire appliance launched in the first place. How long will it take to get there? Will there be water to use when they get there? Often as not, we find that there isn't. Uh, will they be allowed to put water down? Now that sounds a bit, bit strange, but uh, um, with uh, a lot of the UK, um, uh, sits on very porous rock, uh, and in low-lying areas, uh, the, there's a heavy dependency on the water supplies underground, the aquifers, and we're finding more and more that uh, you know, b polluting it by uh, tackling fires above it isn't, is no longer acceptable. Uh, and as I mentioned, we need to, does the insured need to do more in the context of the information that we have? Um, and also forward-looking, we, uh, I don't know how it is for you, but we're in a state of change with our fire and rescue services in the UK. There are great budgetary uh, constraints now, and I think they're about to go into another uh, time of cost saving where they may lose 25% of their budget. That can't happen and there to be a sort of neutral effect. Things will change. And uh, the models that we produced have proved quite popular for actually demonstrating uh, the extent of this change and what it means for fire and rescue service uh, provision. So um, <coughs> this might be a bit confusing. I had hoped to demonstrate a lot of this to you live on the website where these tools sit, but that's not possible with the uh, simultaneous, uh, uh, simultaneous recording that, that they're doing of everything. But uh, in the UK, um, automatic fire alarms are immensely problematic, uh, to, to say the least. I'll be talking more on this later. But as a result, the 50 or 60 fire and rescue services that we have in the UK have adopted different policies for dealing with them. And those policies range from no attendance whatsoever and no further action until someone phones in on a 999 call. You, you laugh, but there are many fire and rescue services doing this. Is, uh, and, is yes. that the case during uh, the strike in London? Oh. Not attend an automatic fire alarm the, the, the certain irony of the strikes is it's the only time we have a common policy from the fire and rescue <laughs> services in the UK uh, for turnout. At least we know what, what they're doing. Uh, but, but you're quite right. Um, I think Warwickshire, Leicestershire, um, they don't turn out uh, for an automatically generated alarm. And, and who can argue with that? If 98, and 98 99% of them are false, you know, what's to believe? And that's something we're, we're addressing. It is a, a very big issue. No matter what type of building the alarm comes from. Well, we, we have the different categories here. Commercial risk, uh, commercial standard risk, commercial high risk. This is our own analysis for each fire authority. So this is Bedfordshire. So Bedfordshire will do callback or filtering. So if they get an alarm, they may try and phone someone up. Uh, if nobody's there, they may stop there. Um, or they may send a, a reduced response, maybe I don't know, someone on a motorbike, something like that, to go and, go and take a look. Uh, so having a remit of life safety means the commercial, they sort of generally leave. Um, healthcare and residential, they will give a, an improved response, uh, but they will provide a response. But they will check it out first, and that all means delay. So it's not an automatic uh, turnout. Uh, residential, it's a, a, you don't often have uh, AFAs from uh, truly residential uh, uh, premises. But these are the type of policies that they have. We have 50 or 60 fire authorities and, all, and they're all different, um, basically. Some are traditional, they'll turn out immediately and they're all ones they'll, they'll, they'll launch. And those are generally the more affluent brigades, I would say. Um, but uh, so what we're doing here is we produced a database that insurers can, can log into when they get a new customer and they can just see what the policy is. And that helps to feed their pricing and their risk control. Fine Rescue Service Response Toolkit. Uh, I hope this will work. We have um, quite rigid 
and I'm sure you probably do too, but it's not like this in America. Uh, America has thousands of fire services, essentially, where every village can buy its own fire engine and crew it themselves, so it's, a, it's an enormous task. But in the UK, we have very rigid rules about, we know where the fire stations are, there are about 2,000 in the, in the UK. Uh, we know, I've managed to find out how, how many appliances are in each one, what type of appliances they have, and how they're crewed through a 24-hour period. And then what we've actually done is um, used uh, GIS, or geospatial systems, to route map between every available postcode in the UK uh, and where all the fire stations are. We've then managed to overlay the crewing options for each of those appliances. And now we have a toolkit where we can work out we, we can just dial up for a given postcode. We know exactly what order fire, fire engines can arrive in. We know exactly how long, far, how far they've had to travel, how long they t they'll take. It's all and predicted. Sorry? It's predicted. Uh, yes, this is using, but it's using proper route mapping. It's as good as it can be. We, we know the fire size, shape, and weight of fire engines. In the route mapping, we don't uh, try and push them under bridges that they can't fit under or put them on roads they're heavier than. Um, Do you compare it at the end with the Real yes, yes, okay. this, is a, this is all being tested through, uh, piloted with Hertfordshire, and it's, it's in keeping with what they want. Yes? Is there any policy that, uh, to do what if the neighbouring service might be quicker? Right. This, is, this uses a policy that the nearest attends, which actually, when you get down to the bottom of it, is the way things generally work uh, in the UK. So I, I've got some examples I, I can show you, but basically we've modelled it for 1 to 20 fire engines. We also look for... Um, uh, aerial appliance delivery and also high volume pumping. Um, we can filter on just immediate response, so that is when the crew is in the station, um, or we can include retained response where they have to be summoned to the station to deploy. And it, and it accurately, accurately takes into account the delays associated with that. And we can, we've got a, we can look at, we've modelled it for every hour and every day of the week, and so we can see how crewing, cha how response changes as you go from daytime to nighttime. Because like I said, the Fire and Rescue Service in the UK, obviously, life safety focus. So in order to cope with, with cuts and to apply their resources more meaningfully, uh, often as not, we're seeing them close down stations in the commercial sectors at night and redeploy them to the stations which are near where people are living uh, during, the, uh, during the nighttime, uh, where, they, where they sleep at night. <coughs> and really, just by varying the arrival time here, you, we, we get a, a nice map for any number of engines being, fire and rescue service being delivered. So in this case, we've asked for the postcode here, somewhere near Milton Keynes. We've asked for four fire engines. We're looking at immediate mobilization only, and, and the, the white areas are exactly where that can happen. This doesn't take into account, obviously, the likelihood of uh, appliances already being out on the run, uh, or indeed whether retained crew are actually available to do, to, to do it, uh, to attend or not. Uh, I do have a video which, can you run the video from here please? Yes. Thank you. This may be a bit arduous. This is the uh, geomapping system which we use to do the, route, uh, the routing calculations. Here are the 2,000 um, uh, stations around the UK. The um, there are about 1.8 million postcodes in the UK. So the number of routes that we actually have to calculate um, are in the billions. It's, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. And if that routing takes uh, one second per calculation, it would take two years to run. So we needed some quite efficient uh, tools to run this. This is showing uh, shape files uh, for uh, two appliances turning up. Um, which one are we actually looking at here? I think two. We've got two appliances. Uh, this is full-time only, and this includes the retained response. And you can see which areas of the country are much more reliant on a retained response. Uh, this is during the daytime, two appliances. This is where, um, where you can deliver two appliances within 10 minutes. And I think this shows differences between day and night. So where you see differences, uh, it's indicative of crewing changes. So we can do this, do this fairly accurately. 
And when you look at the sort of model for the whole of the UK, you know, what, what can be surprising is how many holes there are in there. This is, uh, we're working on the assumption here that firefighting doesn't really start at major instances until there are two, two fire engines there. Um, and you can see coverage in some places, uh, like Wales, it, it follows where London is, Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, don't have a fire in Scotland, it's probably not, a, not going to be good for you there. Uh, there's, there's, there's not a great deal, not a great deal up there. But this is the first time this has ever been done in the UK. Uh, it's probably not unfair to say that the uh, fire and rescue services in the UK operate very independently of each other. And their modelling happens just within their own <coughs> bounds. And uh, this is the first time that anyone's actually uh, put everything together and, and produced the sorts of maps um, that, that work quite well. These work well for the insurer and they work quite well for, uh, for the fire and rescue services as well. This, this information is also available at the uh, fire brigades, but only for a certain county? Uh, no, I actually... Not on a national scale? Uh, no. Um, we, we actually now provide this to the fire and rescue services, um, just to help them understand, and, and many of them are now using this to, to help them with their modelling of change. Uh, in all of the, the fire brigades themselves, regional, are yeah. also obliged to do this. Okay. So it's not possible for you to obtain information from the fire brigades and use it as a... Uh, no. Okay. No. It, it, uh, it hasn't. They, they do have their own risk models and they use a, a model called FSEC, which matches where they need to provide resource versus where uh, instances are actually happening. Um, so that's how they define within their own boundaries what they need to provide. Uh, but uh, uh, on, it doesn't take account of their neighbour's provision. It is quite insular. Uh, and just in their own. So we wanted a, an all-encompassing model. So this, this is software. It's, if anyone wants to play with it afterwards, it's on my laptop there. Um, but uh, I, I had hoped to show you, sort of demonstrate it, demonstrate it live. But basically, all those, we basically create all these different responses as overlays. Um, and so you can produce it like a sort of flip book animation. Um, so if we're just asking for one fire engine, if you dial down the response time, then obviously it shows you where the fire stations are. And, and that's, for one engine, that's, that's very, very nice and very obvious. Um, and what you'll also see is, you, you see some in, uh, initially light up, and they're the full-time ones at this particular time of the day, 12 noon. And then after four or five minutes, you see the retained ones come on to account for the delays which they have. Um, and you can see we've gone for immediate response only, and you can see how the countrified areas this is down in Devon, in the south of England. They're very reliant on a, um, on a retained capability, and you can see how that changes. Now, many insurers do not, uh, do not take account of retained fire service, fire stations, uh, just because the likelihood of them not being available at the time is, is quite high. Um, so, for insurance purposes, they, they so exclude them. So there's no difference in, 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 in premium? Uh, what they, they assume, they like to assume wor worst cases. So they will assume a response from full-time stations only when they're doing their sums. Full-time station only? Yeah. Uh, but for retained, they, they, um, you, often they, they, they ignore it for, for premium setting purposes. So now we can, we can sort of look for sort of 10 fire engines. And so this is the coincidence modeling where you're looking for. And so now these are the areas where you know, in 20 minutes, you can get 10 engines. This is looking for everything, including retained. And so that's the way model works. It's, it's all very nice and uh, straightforward, quite simple. And, it, and it's done for the whole of the UK and, and Northern Ireland uh, as well. And we're now in the process of updating it for, for this coming year as well. Um, whilst um, since we left behind um, our sort of uh, standard response in the UK and have allowed fire and rescue services to take a risk-based risk, risk -based approach or integrated risk management planning, um, we, there hasn't been a great deal of change in what they've always done. Um, but in future years, it's going to accelerate and they will now maybe even stop using fire stations you know, they can predict that they will be needed for road traffic accidents on the M25, typically at rush hour times. So they'll start parking the fire engines on bridges over motorways. So the, uh, this, this will need to re respond to it accordingly. I think we can probably uh, move on from this.
you've probably seen enough. If anyone's interested in it, though, I'm very happy to give you the login details uh, for it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a useful tool. I don't know whether um, it's meaningful to Holland or not, um, whether you have a, a structure that would support something like this, but it does give a nice definitive answer, which is quite unquestionable. Um, so these are, these are also some of the uh, uh, sort of shape files which insurers will overlay, overlay on their systems. Often as not, they want something which is much simpler. Um, for the insurers, they, for a given postcode, this is my postcode, I'm in the back end of nowhere uh, in Warwickshire, and you can see I'm in a thatched house, it's all already looking bad, um, but with, if we look at all appliances, including retained, um, within 10 minutes I get none, within 20 minutes you can get eight attending. Typically for a thatch fire like mine, you might need four or five. Uh, if you are only going to look for immediate mobilization only, that is excluding retains, retained engines, I'm afraid you've got to wait 30 minutes and I'm afraid my house will be gone by then. I, I am the piggy in the little house, of, in the house of straw. Um, so not good news, not good news for me there. Uh, so moving on, the, the third part uh, of, of uh, helping insurers understand um, fire and rescue service responses, we're also changing things so we collect the hydrant data, where fire hydrants are, and that's all now reported to them as well on a postcode basis. Um, and I mentioned water source protection zones. This is a map of the UK um, which shows uh, the areas of geography uh, which have very high porosity rock uh, under which there are aquifers. And so this has all been uh, modelled and it's all now ingrained in law as well. So source protection zones are defined around large and public potable groundwater abstraction sites. Um, the purpose of source protection zones is to provide additional protection, and this is a protection in law, to safeguard drinking water quality. And that's really through constraining the activities that happen on the surface. And so we have, uh, in areas like Cambridgeshire, uh, which is very flat, doesn't have mountains, doesn't have lots of lakes, reservoirs, uh, or anything, they take a lot of water out of the ground. And we've had the Fire and Rescue Service attend to fires very large fires, um, and being told by the environment agency, no, nope, you can't put down a drop of water. You've got to let this burn off. I don't, have you, I don't know whether you've experienced anything like that here? No, anyway, it's, it's, yeah. it, it, it's, posing, it's posing quite a challenge. Um, again, might be a good argument for sprinkler systems, which uh, obviously put, uh, use a lot less water, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, probably uh, classified as an emerging issue. Sorry? Are sprinklers, uh, uh, sprinkling systems allowed to go forward? Well, yes, I think with a sprinkler system, uh, you can also plan to bund the area. You're in much better control uh, of, of what's going on. Um, but certainly, they should be supported just on the sheer uh, quantity, the difference in quantities of water uh, which are actually uh, deployed. Um, now, one thing that uh, I mentioned also is it's important for the insurer to be able to convey to their customers um, you know, the importance of all these factors. Uh, and, and the relevance to it. So we've taken all the fire statistics um, that we collect and we have a very good way of collecting in the, in the UK, uh, both from the Fire and Rescue Service, uh, which is called the IRS, the Instant Reporting System, which is very capable, uh, but also from insurers, it's actually the loss adjuster, um, will actually submit statistics to the FPA on a, on a website that we provide for them. And this follows through the finances of loss. Uh, I know money was mentioned early on today, and it can be quite rare actually really understanding how much is lost. But we collect data for 83 categories of business, and we produce these risk review reports. They're all totally freely available uh, on the Risk Authority website. Um, but basically, uh, what we do is we, on the front side, we have fire statistics. And so it can really help inform uh, the insured um, you know, how many of the fires were, oh, what's this one, this is for recycle, recycling plants, a very big topic in this country and probably in yours as well and every other country uh, where they, we have a fire every, um, every day and a half, we have a major, we have a, we have a big recycling fire uh, in the UK. Um, so this type of data puts it into the context of fires as a whole, um, so for recycling it tells you how many are accidental, how many are deliberate, how many we don't know about the time of the fire, um, impedances to firefighting, so what factors have been important? 
And uh, so in recycling, we can see that access is a problem. The settle-in can be uh, inadequate water supply is quite prevalent, and just firefighting resources to deal with it. And with this knowledge, it, it helps you um, uh, start to put in place some risk control measures that might be beneficial. Um, it also gives the average cost of fire as being about one and a half million pounds. Uh, and in this case, the most valuable information is it splits it up into the, the, the category of insurance loss, whether it's material damage, business interruption, contents, resources, the machine and plant, uh, stock, or, or what have you. Now this has proved, um, day before I came here, yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, I was in the House of Commons presenting exactly this data uh, because there are great moves to, by, by government and by the Environment Agency and the Fire and Rescue Services uh, to try to stop these fires as best they can. Uh, but one thing that's happened in the UK is insurers have stopped insuring recycling plants. Very exceptional situation. I've only, it's only really happened twice. Once was to do with uh, sandwich panels in the food industry where they just became uninsurable because there were so many burning down and it was so expensive and it sent one insurer, uh, it bankrupted one insurer. Um, and uh, more recently, light timber frame constructions of, of significant size. Uh, insurers have uh, pulled away from insuring those, or the major ones have. Um, now, if you think about it, um, this data helped to demonstrate that there are big differences in um, the uh, requirements. The Environment Agency and Fire and Rescue Service want to stop big fires. Obviously, that's their remit. But this data tells us that it's not necessarily the, the stock burning, it's, it's not the, the stuff, uh, the waste material burning, uh, that is causing them the most headaches. Their headaches are about loss of the machine and plant and the material damage done. It's not the burning waste, it's the waste, waste recycling halls themselves. The equipment is incredibly expensive, the business interruption associated with it is very high indeed. They, they carry uh, very large contracts uh, for each of the major cities. And so business interruption, machine and plant, it's not the big fires, it's the, it's the fires which are taking down the recycling halls themselves. And, and, <coughs> sorry, and of course uh, the 45, 44% means uh, when the fire occurs. Yes. Uh, and how long does it take before uh, the, 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 the business is on level as it was before? Ah, well, well um, it takes maybe one year or two. It, it can, and, yeah. and it depends on the type of insurance they bought. Some seldom recover, yeah. um, but it's, uh, yes. It, uh, did, did you ever calculate or predict uh, the, that area of uh, uh, business loss? Not, 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 not for these. What, what I, can, I can tell you the business loss for the insurer. Yeah. An insurer in the recycling business currently will take £1 million pounds of premium and they're currently losing £16 million pounds for every million of premium taken. Oh. It's horrendous for them and this is why they've suddenly decided enough. And now everyone is uh, obviously... For industrial, uh, uh, for industrial buildings in general? Sorry? For industrial buildings in general? No, no, this is for recycling, recycling oh, plants recycling. themselves. Yes, recycling is, a, is, is just a very difficult, they have been very poor adopters of risk control. Insurers have for the last 10 years been trying to get them to fit sprinklers, trying to do this, do that. And um, recycling is obviously, there's some very large contracts being awarded with the EU recycling directives. So now they have the money, uh, I think, to uh, empty the bins of Manchester. It was a two billion pound contract. But the person, the, the organization that won that contract um, you know, they, there is still a reluctance to, to actually um, invest accordingly in risk control that's appropriate to this size of business. Hopefully it's changing. And uh, some big efforts have been made by the recycling, um, uh, the recycling industry itself to bring in new guidance and uh, that was launched just the other day. And hopefully we'll start to see some benefit uh, from that. But it is a big effort here. Yes? Uh, they <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. In, in yeah. Germany, they, they, uh, they cut out the malaria uh, uh, injection yes. uh, for people who go to Africa. Uh, no one went to Africa without the malaria yeah. injection, but the insurance companies didn't have to pay for it anymore. Oh, really? 
uh, right. going to be the same for the insurance company. Okay. I, I think the, the, the whole picture would be quite complex because in order to be a waste recycler in the UK, you need a licence to operate your site. And I think it will be made a condition of having a licence that you are insured. So I think there is, this is all uh, you know, wrapped up in, in something bigger. Uh, I think I'm pretty hopeful that the waste recycling business in the UK is starting to respond and starting to understand its responsibilities. The guidance that they produced is good. I think what we're waiting to see is whether it gets used properly. There are some good examples about that. I shouldn't paint the whole thing as bad, but, uh, but it, we're in a difficult situation currently. What are the statistical numbers for the UK about how many companies did not survive the business after having a fire? Right. The, um, you, you've hit on a good point. Uh, as, a, as a whole, the anecdotal evidence is, uh, uh, they say, about 40% um, 40, 40 of businesses don't recover. Within well, with it, I, yeah, uh, and I, I think uh, th there's another statistic that, that's within two or three years, but there's another st statistic that says that 80% um, uh, of businesses that have had a fire, a major fire, uh, will fail in the next two years. But now my view on that is actually slightly differently because different. Um, I would reword that. I would sort of say that actually 80% of businesses that have had a major fire within two years demonstrate themselves to have been poorly managed. Because every company should have a business continuity plan. Every company should be able to protect itself um, by some means from these adverse events. And uh, business continuity planning is just not well enough understood. And the responsibilities of managing directors of companies, they, they understand that they have to make profit. They understand that they shouldn't kill their employees during the normal sort of business. Um, but they do also have responsibilities. And it, and it is written in company law that they must act in, the, in accordance with the best interests of their investors and their employees. And that says to me business resilience. And yet it's always forgotten and no one works to it. And uh, yes, we, we have a bit of a campaign going at the moment where I'm trying to insult every managing director in the UK, I think, by, <laughs> by reminding them of their... Uh, Social responsibility. It, it is. And also regarding uh, CSR. Yes. I mean, at, at the moment, we, uh, when you have total separation of uh, life safety and property protection, um, you, that needs to go along with an awareness that um, you know, there is an additional responsibility based on business to protect themselves. But business is sitting there thinking, oh, I've, I've got a fire risk assessment, so I'm okay, but that doesn't protect their business. We've got a fire and rescue service, well, I'm okay there. That might protect their business, but there's no onus uh, on them to necessarily. And, and so there is, a, there is a complete lack of understanding here, and there needs to be a big educational job done. Shouldn't, isn't it time to rethink if the, the fire service responsibility should also cover more of the business part and not only the life saving part, since everybody is depending <coughs> on the tax that comes in also the fire service? I mean, you give the best example by saying there's 25% of budget cuts. Yeah. Well, and it's uh, more interesting in the, in the UK, some of the major metropolitan fire, and rest fire services, like London, they actually receive money from insurers uh, to help with uh, property protection. But it's not, written in, it's not written in law that it has to be done. Don't get me wrong, fire and rescue services save a great deal of property. But I think really the sort of handbook of firemanship really states um, you know, you will take no risk to save property. You will take no risk to save lives which are not savable. You may take some risk to save lives which are savable. That, that's, quite, that's quite a demanding package. I don't think it's, it's really about the risk. It's just about the number of resources you can save. Yeah. Uh, I, yes, I, I would agree. But uh, basically, uh, when you look to places like the US and, and probably Germany as well, in their codes, Life safety is achieved through the use of good performing materials, more so than it is anywhere that allows fire engineering as a discipline. And I was over in the States recently and talking to an FPA, and they were saying, well, fire is kind of, um, you know, people are losing interest in fire a bit because it's, it's not contributing enormously. Um, you know, it's, it's not a major worry, actually. And the only differentiator that we have is that um, you know, ingrained in their building codes is a high level of business and property protection. 
Now, I, I think I argued later in the night with uh, <laughs> Mostyn on fire engineering and how we view it in the UK. Uh, I know we're devi deviating a little, but if you're still interested, we'll carry on talking. Um, in, in 2000, I think it was around 2000, they introduced fire engineering as a discipline. So we had prescriptive codes which said you would build like this. Obviously, that makes it difficult building nice things like airports and prestigious buildings. Uh, but it introduced a line saying, unless you can think of another way of doing it, which preserves life safety. And in that grew up the discipline of fire engineering. And, um, you know, we have hundreds of fire engineers in the UK. We probably have five major fire engineering <coughs> projects going on in the UK, things like airports and major buildings. And you have to ask yourself, what are the other 500 doing? <coughs> and what they're actually doing, often as not, is, is value engineering. They're being paid by contractors to remove cost from the building. And so we see, and, and they're very proud about it, often as not, we see them re removing passive protection, we see them removing active protection, we see them getting around local laws which demand greater level of resilience, just by justifying it on the grounds, doing nice calculations <coughs> and presenting nice pictures and modelling to show that, actually, you know what, everyone's going to be out of the building before it collapses. And that's it. And in that, we remove a lot of business resilience. So I've gone on a, a little bit of a hobby horse there of mine uh, currently. I hope you don't mind. Um, right. Um, yeah, so uh, the n next release of some of this uh, software that we provide to insurers, will, will, it'll have the uh, arrival time information, but it'll also have information on the AFA, whether there'll be water supplies, how many fire hydrants, uh, whether it's in a source protection zone, whether it's in a flood zone, and we're going to add uh, some other details as well. So it's all about aggregating big data and getting it in a nice presentable form. Um, one of the other things that we've been doing is it, the fire and rescue services quite like this model. And um, this is a, a county, a fire authority in, in the UK, and they wanted us to explore what would happen if they moved some stations around, open some, close some, and uh, uh, you know, change the crewing uh, at various periods of the day for it as well. And this is trying to, obviously, trying to make the most best that they can uh, with the budgets that are available. And so this was, uh, I think I just had it in five, 10, 15 minute um, sort of intervals here. And uh, here's the proposed crewing after we invoke the changes. So clearly what they've done is taken some over provision around here and spread it into these areas where uh, they're not. And then very simply, we can then subtract one from the other and you can see what the, what the benefit is or what the difference is. And this is the type of modeling that is increasingly being undertaken in the UK to try and make the most of what you've got. Right, any, any questions on that bit or is everyone fairly? Fairly I'm happy. about the response time, which was nearly half an hour for an area ladder. Yeah. Shouldn't it be the other, under, the other way around that you say the ladder should be at a spot within, I don't know, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, the latest? Yeah. Um, you need to take slightly account of where I live, uh, which is in the middle of nowhere. Um, I, ladders are normally positioned around major cities. Um, so I'm about half an hour from Oxford, and I think that's where, the, uh, uh, where, where they've got taller buildings. It's not very tall. But the question is, do we need a ladder there? Right. Uh, yeah, it depends very much on what's, you know, what is there. That I, um, yes, there is some confusion as to how they operate their ladders as well, whether it's on a retained basis or sometimes I think they'll jump crew it. So they'll take a, take a fireman off the appliance that's attending and he'll hop off and he'll drive that behind them. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's slightly unclear. I just put that in because they, they gave me the information. Um, so I haven't answered your question properly, but... Uh, it's the best I can do. Uh, right, so AFAs. Um, again, uh, we, we spoke about this um, uh, somewhat. Uh, in our own minds, it, the whole system of automatic fire alarming in the UK uh, is, is broken. Um, they're very prevalent, over 95%, possibly even more, uh, of alarms generated by them are, 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 are false or unwanted. False being... Um, steam from the shower um, or generated from something totally different, dust um, and unwanted being yes it's smoke but it's from a cigarette or it's from people burning the toast in their kitchen and uh, so no, one, no one's believing them um, fire and rescue services, many don't turn out at all uh, without other actions being taken, sometimes it's actually phoning up the premises, many of them they actually wait for a 999 call to come in 
And you know, if that's happening at night time, um, you know, that basically starts to suggest flames have broken out and got through the roof before someone can notice. Insurers no longer recognise the benefit of them, so what, what's the point? There's no financial incentive. Uh, we know that uh, in the UK, fire and rescue services are starting to take some quite punitive measures. If they keep being called out, then they will charge uh, the owner, so that means they're being switched off. That's no good. Um, installers, in order to preserve their reputation, are telling people to go back in the building to check it really is a fire. Now that runs slightly contrary to what I was taught at school about, you know, run out and leave everything behind. You know, don't go in looking for the fire. Um, and occupants don't really believe them either because obviously they, you know, they, they, don't, they don't egress with the uh, speed with which uh, they, they might do if they had any sort of faith uh, in it. Um, so the, the upshot of this is uh, a very much increase in the, in the cost of fire and rescue services of, uh, I think, um, 512,000 turnouts uh, in, the U in the UK, um, over a quarter of a million, so over half of those were in response to false, false alarms. It's a, it's, it must be an enormous financial burden. And when you're trying to spread money efficiently, that's clearly uh, an area that needs to be, uh, it needs to be sorted out. Um, with each of the fire and rescue services having different policies for AFA, it, it causes a lot of problems. There's potential for people to be standing outside their building, having the alarm gone off, everyone standing in the car park, assuming the fire, is going to fire and rescue service is going to turn up, and they may not realise they need to phone up. They need to do, take another action, say, look, I think we've got a fire. Um, there's a cost of business, uh, certainly increased property loss um, results from this because of the uh, increased time. Increased potential for loss of life, I think it's always going to be there, uh, and increased insurance premiums. You know, these, they're just not getting, uh, getting any benefit. The only people that do seem to benefit are the, are the people who maintain these systems, because they've tried to get over this 95% failure rate um, by maintaining it sort of every week and testing alarms every week. And I can't really think of any other safety system where such poor performance is tolerated. It seems absolutely unforgivable. And uh, in the UK, I don't know whether things are better here, but in, in the UK, it's really driven by our building codes that, that demand the installation of these very poor systems. And this is a development within the uh, insurers, but are there not also uh, developments going on within the rule makers and within the fire brigade? Right, the, the problem? well, I think everyone is, I don't think they're making the pro problem any better, but what they are doing is they're putting in coping policies, coping strategies. So fire and rescue services not turning out, that's a way of coping with it. It's not solving the problem. Um, uh, people have these, these immense uh, maintenance regimes. Um, you know, that's a way of coping with it, but it's not necessarily solving the problem. Uh, insurers not insuring, giving benefit. It's a coping policy, it's not solving the problem. So what we want to do is to solve the problem now. And um, the, the, from our perspective, uh, at the heart of this is the smoke detector itself. It's a poor piece of kit. It alarms to smoke, but it alarms to lots of other things as well, and it alarms very readily. And, um, you know, there are now very good triple sensor devices on the market. We've tested them, we've played with them. They're nearly infallible, to be perfectly honest, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any real um, burden in detection time. Um, and I don't think anymore, even the cost that they're more, uh, the, the, the argument that they cost a lot more, I don't think that even stacks up anymore. I think it is just the will to get them in, into place. So uh, when you're obviously detecting on smoke is, is great, but a cigarette will alarm it. Detect on smoke and heat, well, a cigarette's not going to make that alarm. Detect on smoke, heat, and CO, and, and you start to you know, get over shower steam and everything else. For everything you add to it, you drastically cut the false alarm response rate uh, for it. So these are, often as not, they're slot in replacements. You just need to reprogram the panel on modern systems and your problem will be gone. The next challenge then is to, well, how can you instruct the um, fire and rescue service that actually this alarm you should believe, whereas other alarms you shouldn't believe. And I think here we, the alarm receiving centres can come to, uh, come to our aid. You, you have a, alarm receiving centres here or is is everything direct connection. Um, so uh, having spoken to them and with the Chief Fire Officers Association in the UK, they're fine to set up a, you know, if you like, a, a separate channel. So 
normal smoke alarms alarm on one channel, high integrity alarms systems such as this come in on another one. And then of course they can adopt a different policy, which if you're 80% sure that it really is a fire, you'll launch immediately on that. Throw away all these sort of silly coping strategies and, and just get out there. Um, and there's another, um, I would throw another type of alarm system into that category and that would be sprinkler alarms. Sprinkler alarms you know, are pretty good, um, you know, are good, good, good indications of fire. By, by very nature, and that could go on that channel as well. And uh, uh, we think here there's, uh, uh, there's, 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 a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of mileage in doing this, and we really are trying to drive this through, and we've managed to get it on the agenda of our next review of building regulations. I say, I really do want to see the end of the smoke, smoke detector uh, in, um, uh, in commercial premises. Um, now, the other thing about this is they're much more resilient to abuse. Um, Require, may require um, reduced maintenance and testing, reduced through cost life, this has all been proven, uh, a retrofit can be relatively easy and also they can actually provide a lot more data uh, as well about sort of size of fire and things like that if people want to get more, more inventive uh, with it. But you see so much of what we've got currently is oh do I take a thermal detector or do I take a, a smoke detector, location, well you know but all these hurdles are overcome if they are much more resilient to false alarming and, um, you know, yes, they can be abused, they can be poorly maintained, they've still got a much higher likelihood of working. If you have uh, three sensors in those new uh, data yes. protection systems, um, if one of the three is not working, yeah. you don't have a proper alarm. Right. They, they have different ways of, the algorithms are very clever for these things. So um, they'll give a sort of, they'll wake up and start thinking when they get one, and then they start looking around for a second one. Um, they, may value, they may alarm on smoke, and, and carbon monoxide, or they may alarm on smoke and heat. But they also, if they don't get um, something satisfactory, they may wait a certain amount of time and, and look at magnitude of heat, smoke, or carbon monoxide before they do something. They, they, they are very inventive. And actually, coming back to your question on standards, the standards bodies need to respond to these sorts of detectors now, and that's something that we are we're, we're trying to deal with currently. Um, so what, what have we done with this? We, we've met with government and we've had a big discussion with them. And uh, we are, our building regula regulations review committee uh, is meeting, is due to meet for the first time in about five years um, next year. And uh, this will be quite high up the agenda. Uh, we've also annoyed government in, immediate, uh, uh, also by uh, having a post, postcard campaign. So we have lots of people writing in postcards to support this initiative, which you think will change things. It's, it's rotten to the core and it just needs uh, changing. Um, the other thing I'm doing is um, we are I'm, I'm finding a very problematic um, building, such as a student halls of residence, um, or, or a school, or a nursing home, something like that, which has a very poor record, and we're going to pay to change up to 300 sensors in that. And then we will monitor performance. Uh, naively, I thought we'd have to monitor it for a year, uh, but the local fire officer tells me, I'll know after a week, <laughs> because they turn up there five times a week. And, um, you know, I think this is a, there's, there's some merit in, in what we're doing here. Um, Technologies that support a more timely response by, by way of intervention. Now, uh, in, in Holland, I know there's been a lot of work going on on uh, the Cobra cutting systems, and I know that uh, uh, Ricardo, spoken to Ricardo and René uh, on it at length. And, and we've been looking at them too. Um, they are very simple, uh, just a, a cutting water lance, very high pressure, low flow. Capability to add abrasive to the flow so you can cut through concrete, steel, wood, whatever you like. Um, and very easily deployable. You can have 300 meters of small bore hose. So the idea is you can run off with this long distances. Uh, and being high pressure, you can go up to some quite high distances. Um, this, is, this work was funded by Manchester, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. Um, and uh, really they, they have some particular challenges which I'm sure are common to everyone. Firefighting at height being one of them. Supply of water to traditional equipment is challenged uh, at height quite quickly and um, you, yes, you, know, you can have lots of pressure at the, uh, you, can, you can have lots of pressure at your fire engine but, but not a great deal of flow. Um, but 
deployment speeds of traditional equipment, like lay flat hoses to, to get up to those sorts of height, um, are severely punished by going up at height because obviously you don't want to be in an unsafe situation where you're trying to invoke a uh, an entry into a compartment um, uh, without being properly supported with additional equipment, additional people and personnel. So it's generally a slow process. Um, and there's a long period of time while all this is being prepared where if you had the right sort of kit, you could be doing something and taking advantage of that lost time. The other place that's problematic, and this is where in the UK we lose, uh, we, we've lost quite a few firefighters, is in fighting fires in basements. And uh, basements typically, they can have very high fuel loadings, limited or no ventilation, single point access from a very disadvantageous position. So you're going right down into the, the hot layer. Um, uh, attempts to, or when you, when you ventilate the compartment, that can cause a very hazardous situa situation indeed uh, because of your having to go over the, uh, the floor um, uh, where there's a fire below, uh, there's great potential for structural instability uh, and it proves very difficult to read the hazards uh, in these situations and uh, it, it's, it's very difficult. So, the deployment theory uh, for high-rise firefighting um, the idea is that it doesn't require firefighters to commit uh, to entering the on-fire compartment. You can just deploy your hose, get up there, um, try and locate the fire within the, in the compartment as best you can, and then cut through the wall and start giving water to it, um, injecting the media directly into where uh, it can do most good. Uh, the beauty about this is you're putting in water, but obviously you're not putting in any uh, 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 any oxygen at the same time. So I know you're all familiar with this, I'm teaching you to suck eggs I think, uh, but bear with me. Um, but the, I think the most important factor here is it can be deployed quickly and it's in a time where you can't do anything anyway because there are other jobs to be done with traditional equipment. So the result is you manage to use available time uh, to its best. When it comes to um, the benefits of this, speed of response greatly improved. The fire will be smaller at the time when you start to manage it. Uh, entry will be possible sooner because you've controlled things better. Uh, and uh, the environment will have been pre-prepared for entry. Now in the UK, as I'm sure uh, the case here, um, we, we, there's, there's great, there are many drivers to why firefighting should be becoming more defensive. Um, certainly to you know, health and safety uh, and um, you know, maybe not taking as many risks as might have historically been done. Uh, in the context of our building structures are not, uh, uh, are not as uh, strong as they used to be um, and, and many other reasons beside, not least to say some of the court cases we've had uh, recently in, in the UK. Um, but it, you know, if you look to the health and safety executive in the UK, one of their primary requirements is wherever possible you've pre-prepared the enclosure to make it safe so that uh, PPE is less challenged and the firefighters less challenged, so more likely of success. And this certainly ticks all those boxes. Uh, so this, this project, um, it really wasn't to look so much at performance. I think performance in small compartments is proven. You don't, don't need to go and keep reinventing that wheel. We were actually asked to look at the liabilities of using this system in the context of any occupants that might be taking refuge in an adjacent bedroom or, or something like that. Uh, because there is scope to, um, uh, to harm them if, if it's all done wrongly. Uh, so we, all, but we did look at uh, performance. We actually looked at the, uh, we were asked to investigate whether um, bringing in other methods like, uh, um, oh, sorry, that's actually about wind assisted fires, whether, um, whether wind assisted, whether it would still be viable um, if uh, at height uh, there was a significant wind impact on it uh, and to make, uh, uh, to, to support development of as F SOPs. We did also look at it with positive pressure ventilation as well to see whether, it, uh, whether they could sit well together. Um, so in terms of life safety, the idea is the hypothesis that if you inject small amounts of water into a very hot compartment, it really turns into a lot of steam and it turns into very energetic steam as well. And that you can imagine that rushing out of the fire compartment and there may be an occupant in a bedroom with the window open and it will egress through there. And an occupant who was otherwise safe, they might have been hiding under a bed, they might be low level, is now suddenly drenched in uh, very energetic steam and their lives are made worse, which is an interesting hypothesis. 
and one certainly that, uh, that, that we need to look into. Now steam can transport uh, a lot more energy than just dry heat. So uh, typically around 80 or 90 degrees, dry heat is kind of, it's unpleasant, but it's uh, sort of tolerable. Um, but uh, if it's steam at that same temperature, um, you will know about it instantly and very quickly because it will be carrying about eight to 10 times the amount of energy with it. Even though a thermocouple will tell you they're the same, they're the same challenge. They're just not uh, because of the latent heat of uh, uh, vaporization. Uh, so the other thing that happens, aside from the additional energy transport, obviously there's a big expansion that can drive what's hot down to the ground where, what, uh, where you might otherwise, things might otherwise be quite cool. So we've got two major effects uh, to look at. And um, we put it all in a report. I'm not too sure of the quality of this video. Could you just uh, run the video, please? This is really just to show you the rig uh, that we built. Um, what we took was a very standard one-bedroom apartment, um, which is used in uh, all sorts of urban regeneration uh, places um, around, the, around the UK. Nice flats. Well, we just recreated it in a fire-resisting form. Uh, we've got a nice uh, big laboratory. Uh, this is our. This was actually my one-bedroom flat. I think we had the uh, living room, living room, kitchen, diner here. This was a bedroom over the other side, is the entrance and the hallway and the toilet and bathroom. And uh, but I did put a bit on top uh, so that we could actually look at, you know, whether things were two stories, but also if we were to look at a basement, so we could we could sort of go up there and we could cut downwards into the fire compartment. <coughs> Uh, this was the system that we used. Uh, for these tests, we used uh, the cold cut system. Uh, this was loaned by Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. And there's Dan Moore having a play, um, cutting in through uh, around our window to try and inject into the enclosure itself. I think they make these things deliberately long so you can't cut your own feet off. Are these now embedded in? In, in Dutch Fire and Rescue Service, so you, anyone? Uh, that was uh, sort of cutting down through the ceiling for a, for a, to tackle a basement fire uh, down there. We had uh, this uh, instrumented to the hilt uh, for, for gas concentration, heat flux, temperatures. Um, So these are heat flux meters. I'll describe these in due course, but these actually give you the total dosing uh, of heat energy in watts per meter squared that you get, not just, not just temperature. And we also looked at how um, uh, you know, material, small amounts of material and PPE would protect you uh, from the instant heat flux, um, which is a combination of obviously radiation, conduction, convection, steam dep deposition. Um, so we had a look at lots of things. Uh, this was the arrangement where we were looking at positive pressure ventilation to see whether it could be used in conjunction with that. Uh, the fuel loads that we used, we did some stylized fuel loads, uh, which were wood um, with lots of PVC, well, sorry, with lots of uh, uh, plastic, I think those was uh, high-density polyethylene on top, uh, to the quantities that might be found in a typical flat, uh, and we created some large wooden surfaces uh, for it to deal with as well. But certainly this is an enclosure that gets up to flash over, essentially. No, so the idea is that, I mean, no one's going to survive in this enclosure, but it's really about the survival of people in the adjacent enclosures when we actually extinguish. And we set it up as a, a sort of house configuration. If you end up living in a house like this, you haven't done very well in life. I'm afraid it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yes.
So we start off by putting a very significant fire in this compartment. The, the doors between the, um, this room, the hallway, and the bedroom are cracked open. This would be the bedroom, and probably where our occupant might, if they've got any sense, be hiding uh, on this. Okay, then we, once we've got the fire compartment hot enough, we, we seal it all up, basically. It is a ventilation-controlled fire, so it's quite tricky getting heat into it in the first place. And the things we varied during these tests were the duration in which, the duration and flow rate, actually, in which you apply the, the water mist. And, um, it, you know, it's quite interesting um, in terms that if you go in too light, that can be quite, quite a, present quite a harmful situation. Um, go in with too much, that can be quite a harmful situation. You need to get, sort of get it right. Uh, so here he is, this is uh, Dan Moore from Northamptonshire Fire and Rescue Service. And what you'll see is as soon as he starts spraying that, the, um, you'll see the smoke coming out. This will all contract with the temperatures, so it's on. And you'll see it's like someone's drawn a line under there, and the smoke stops coming out because everything's shrunk down inside. And then he'll complete, and then you'll see a very large steam return coming out through the bedroom there. Will only work with a ventilation controlled Sorry, the, will it only work? Yeah. Um, no, no, this was. Um, Yes, yes, and that, that is something that we, we actually looked at in, in this also, and I'll make some conclusions on that. So the to total amount of water, I think he's injecting in this particular case 60 litres a minute uh, for one minute, so just 60 litres, and you see the, the steam, and uh, you know, that steam is quite energetic as it comes through, and um, I think we've probably seen enough of that. Given the time, I'll carry on. Now, what type of sensors do we use for doing this? Well, uh, as I said, you can't just use thermocouples because 75 degrees dry looks like 75 degrees hot, but in actual energy terms, they're very different. So what I produced was these are cooled targets using uh, the cooling units that you get for liquid cooling of uh, chips in your computer, uh, your, uh, uh, the, the, the processor. And I put on that a thin film heat flux meter so we can keep this at a constant temperature, which is sort of skin temperature. So here we go. We can, uh, and then you can put dry heat over it from a, from a heat gun, and then you can put steam over it. And whereas the thermocouples here give exactly the same figure, you can see that uh, for dry heat, we're getting just over 2,000 watts per meter squared. But for steam, we're getting nearly 20,000 watts per meter squared. So it's a nice sensor uh, that we've developed to really show the difference. And this is the sort of reason why, you know, why steam burns are so, uh, so aggressive uh, when they happen and so difficult to, um, uh, to deal with sometimes. So we had a good sensor suite in there. Um, in terms of uh, safety case, you know, what are we actually looking for? Um, getting data on, on what's dangerous and what's not uh, can be a little bit problematic. Um, but there's, there's a range of things. So, Heat stroke, you know, can be long durations at some quite low temperatures. But uh, skin pain or burns, exposure to convected heat over 120 degrees, convected heat greater than 60 degrees. But these are the sorts of figures that actually, if you can measure heat flux, you can work to greater than um, two and a half kilowatts. And um, that is really described as instantaneous and undeniable pain. So, which is a nice figure to work with. Uh, for us. Uh, respiratory tract burns, this is something we're now moving on to take a look at, and we've used these sensors to build a sort of synthetic throat, um, which, we, uh, uh, which we're using in some testing, which uh, completed last week and is due to just uh, go through the final part uh, on Monday. So the results. Um, 
the use of uh, the sort of ultra high pressure cutting extinguishing systems uh, like this we did find they can certainly under circumstance, certain circumstances make it worse for an occupant in there now that's a little bit worrying but I would say it occurs in locations where an occupant is very unlikely to be it actually occurs in areas where um, just like if you think of steam com coming out of directly out of kettle close to the spout you put your hand there you will have a dreadful burn very quickly move it a short distance away and you end up with a warm moist hand distance is everything here steam loses its energy uh, quite quickly uh, with distance um, and yes if they happen to be peering through a crack in the door just as this happens they may get burnt um, if they're high at high level uh, it's going to be worse as well um, but generally occupants are as far away from the fire as possible and they're generally at low level um, so certainly uh, there's a, uh, a note of caution but I wouldn't get too hung up on about, uh, hung up about it these are also very transient events they happen quickly you're only looking for protection for you know a minute um, or, or however long the steam is generated and what we did find was that any clothing that the occupants seem to be wearing um, would afford uh, great protection uh, against this and maybe this needs to uh, point to the fact that maybe we need to sort of advise people accordingly on, on how to protect themselves in the event of a fire uh, when, when systems like this might be used. Here's the uh, um, sort of thing I'm talking about, a, a classic signature. So here we've let the fire develop. Um, this is a, a sensor which is um, at low level where the occupant might be, uh, but quite close. But you can see a characteristic here. The temperature, we, we inject the agent and the temperature drops but the heat exposure to the person increases which runs contrary to what you might expect um, but is a true representation this can only be achieved through the steam dosing that the person is receiving at that location uh, so it is possible and that's the sort of evidence uh, that we have for it um, now if I'm going to conclude on this one in the sealed condition as you were talking about windows breaking and the like Cutting was effective, uh, oh, oh sorry, yeah, cutting was very effective, I, I could, we couldn't find much it couldn't cut through, although I understand if things are a bit rubbery, like a grain silo, plastic grain silo, they can struggle there. Um, the introduced water mist quickly reduced the fire compartment gas temperatures, uh, which in turn cooled adjacent spaces. The fire was usually suppressed or, uh, or extinguished, you know, we're not in big rooms here, we're talking about 80 cubic metre rooms. Um, conditions the point of firefighter entry were, were very much improved. In the wind assisted condition, the temperatures are only suppressed during water application. It's just simply not enough water to do things. So here we had the broken window scenario that you spoke of. We had, so we're assuming that um, this is a fire at height. It's quite windy up there. We have fire coming, well, air coming in, feeding the fire, a formerly ventilation controlled fire. Um, and now it can really just. Uh, I'm afraid 60 litres a minute isn't enough. Um, and on cessation, when you, when you stop applying the, the system, uh, everything recovers very quickly. There's no legacy benefit. Um, that's, that, that would be uh, uh, mythical. And steam production is obviously very high indeed uh, during this period. So, um, and, uh, and, and that it certainly increased heat transport to the occupant. Yeah. Okay. Yes? I never saw any test with the Cobra system on the new facades, with the new facade installation or with frame yeah. house with uh, insulation filling be in between the frames because no. I was told by experience of some fire brigade it simply will not penetrate. Really? And that's very interesting to know because that's something we're interested in, in, in also. Because we are testing a system basically that works the best on, on, on facades that are played. Yeah. We still have them but they become outdated. Yeah. In my country, okay. for example, I'm working in Luxembourg. I'm a German but I'm working in Luxembourg. Okay. We must have the, the non- uh, the, the low energy houses yes and they're doing that in the UK as well and so. yes yeah, so, so I think there are things that can upset that what I would say is it doesn't have to often is not the preferred point of entry for these might be the window frame itself and that gets you around a lot of often as not the the, the, the the cladding issues and suddenly it's sometimes through the front door or a door or something letterbox always a good point place um, so yeah I, I understand I, I'm interested in the same things also um, so I think uh, probably in summary, when the enclosure allows for containment of the steam uh, fire prevent, uh, uh, and prevention of reventilation, um, it's very uh, benefit is quick and it's sustained. When aggressively ventilated, either deliberately through PPV or because windows are broken, um, 
it's not really there. It's not the right technology. Um, so our recommendations from this, occupant harm is, is possible, uh, but it, as, as I said before, it occurs in locations which are, they're unlikely to be in. Um, and uh, uh, often there's not, these are in fires where they would be overcome by other factors as well because of the uh, absolute intensity uh, of the fire. Um, limited co clothing can offer substantial protection. Respiratory sensitivity, we're, we're looking at that currently. Um, and the next steps, as I said, we're looking at the throat burns. Uh, we're looking at extended range of suppliers, so our next testing, which is happening next week, is for large commercial premises to see if there is any benefit in this. This testing would suggest that actually it's not the right equipment for use in large compartments, but let's have a look. You know, we're talking large commercial premises I have a great interest in uh, with an insurance background. You know, rather than having fire and rescue services standing off um, because there's no life risk, it would be lovely if there was a low consequence option with no safety implications that they could deploy in some warehouse fires. But how many do you need? You know, do you need uh, one or do you need 20? We're going to try with four next week. So we have suppliers from an Italian supplier. I can't remember their name at the moment. We've got uh, some supplied by Cold Cut and we've got some supplied by a British company called BHR. And uh, we're going to be uh, trying, I think we may have five actually, to try in a 1,200 uh, cubic meter enclosure to see if there's any benefit uh, in that. That's it from me. Now I think we're probably a bit early, so you're going to have to start talking. Um, I've, I've got to think of how much time we actually have left. I think we've probably, we've got a, sorry? I think it would be up to uh, 3 o'clock. What? Do we? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, well that sounds that sounds good. Right, does anyone have any questions about that or, or anything else that that we may or may not be doing? Did you publish the results from the test, or is it more for internal use? No. We uh, the uh, the initial tests were published uh, were, were were financed by Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, uh, and I think they are looking. Uh, they haven't authorised publication of that work yet, but they know they know I'm here talking to you on it today. Um, but the, the second phase of work that we're currently involved in, that was funded by a charitable trust. And so that will be made freely available. And that's looking at, uh, as I say, throat burning and, and, and large commercial premises. Is there any link or cooperation between the testing you do, as far as the uh, cold cutter is concerned, with the European project, uh, say, Firefight? Because it's exactly about the same. Is it? Right. It's financed by the European uh, Union and co-financed by some Swedish companies. It's called uh, okay. Firefight. It's now the, the second step. Right. Maybe I some of the Swedish colleagues can answer this, but... Uh be nice to know about. We generally, I'm afraid, plough our own furrows on these things uh, because uh, I have a, a sort of very impatient customers <laughs> who can't wait for European work, generally. It's true, yes. it's true to say that if the work's funded by Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, that's using public money. So officially, they should make the research available. If yeah. freedom of information, we have a freedom of information <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly not their intention to keep it secret. This is actually beneficial to them. I think it shows that they've, react, they've acted very well to basically spend money to look at liabilities rather than just performance issues. And uh, I think they've done well to do so. You can make yourself popular with Steve McGurk by, by presenting that. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't do that. <laughs> but uh, but it, it will all become available, yes. Just one question. Uh, we talked about the 44% business interruption. Yes. Can you give us some more substantiation? How you right. calculate that? Uh, this is for bus businesses failing. Uh, In 45, 44% of all industrial buildings. 44% uh, of the fires was in the industry. 44% of the fires. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to go back on? I've lost, uh, my, lost my clicker now. Let me go and have a look. 44% of the damage was concerning the business interruption. Oh, was that on the on that slide? On the yeah. on the slide. Yeah. Right. I, I think it may have been saying there that 40% of the fires reported were in commercial premises, were in, in industrial premises. I'll need to see. Well, I'll need to see the actual wording. Oh, sorry. Let me have a look. Let's go back. Oh. There we go. Ah, you're looking here. Yeah. Right. What this says is, right, what it means is 
uh, when, there's, when there's a fire loss, um, there may be lots of insurers around and they will be insuring different components. Yeah. Some may, like your, your own home, you may have a, a different insurer for the building and your contents. Yeah. Um, so, and, and with commercial premises, uh, they may insure material damage so to the building, so it's a building damage. Uh, business interruption may be separately insured, or it could all be with one insurer. Okay, so of this mean value of one, around one and a half million pounds, if you say, where's that money gone? What, what's the insurer paying it out for? 17% uh, of that is to replace machinery and plant equipment that has been damaged. Yep. 24% of that is to replace the building, which is burnt down. 44% is to cover the loss of income, which they can't do in a, for a year afterwards, yeah, yeah. typically a year afterwards, um, which, which they now can't do. So when you, what you generally find is that in commercial and industrial and industrial processing, um, business interruption is generally the biggest sum. Um, it's, the biz, it's the business that they've lost. And that gets covered by the insurer um, for one year. And then at the end of that year, hopefully they've recovered everything so they can now continue business as usual. When you look at things like warehousing, these values change a great deal. Generally, it's to do with you know, the contents, um, the material damage of the building, and business interruption. You know, if they've got more than one warehouse filled with the same stuff, then generally business interruption is, is a small value. So this is all about um, covering the costs of lost income. And, and certainly, uh, it's a very large part of most industrial and manufacturing processes. Totally, it's 100%. Yes, totally, yeah. it's 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but the, I mean, the interesting thing from recycling, it's, it's not the loss of their raw materials or their process materials that, where the costs are. Um, the, the insurer's interests are in the, 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 the machinery and the equipment and the business continuity requirements. Okay. Your overview was mainly focused on uh, research and projects on uh, response by the fire brigade. Yes. In relation to insurers. They like to understand also them. Also working on uh, uh, improving prevention in cooperation with fire brigades. Right. We produce um, a, an enormous library of risk control documents, which cover many things, simple things like uh, uh, safe hot works, you know, uh, uh, you know protect, prevention measures for, for anyone welding or, or, or whatever, um, right down to uh, how to store batteries, uh, how to take care of uh, uh, flammable liquids, how to store them. So we've got a very large, very large library of risk control documents for fire and security and for environmental impact. They are all available free, entirely freely of charge on the Risk Authority website. And so insurers will, often as not, they host them on their own websites and distribute those. But also fire and rescue services are using these documents as well. So if they come across anyone who has a particular issue, uh, we write them on all, all manner of things. It can be, generally they're written where insurers have to repeat themselves. So we have them for things like spark erosion machining, fire protection of clean rooms, um, you know, any high hazard process, unattended processes. So we produce these simple guides and generally the fire and rescue service or the insurer can hand it to the, uh, hand it to the insured or the customer and basically say, if you do it this way, you know, I think everyone will be happy. Uh, so we, we give away everything absolutely freely. Um, the fire and rescue services like the information and they're, they're, they prove very effective at spreading it for us. And particularly these... Um, the, these documents, uh, these, these, these are just one-page one sheets, but they're immensely informative. So we produce these for warehousing, uh, industrial processing, printing, um, textile, publicly available yeah. on the Risk Authority website. And so what they contain is they contain the background to everything. You know, typ typically the mean cost of fire is this. This is where the money's lost. But on the other side, it, it'll say things like, well, the statistics show that 70% of these fires are... Um, started deliberately. So therefore, you know, security is an issue. Can you look at this document, that document? And so it points them in the right direction, but it's all properly placed in the context of what is really happening out there. And uh, I'll say there are 83 of them, and they cover a huge range of, huge range of risks.
Uh, but they proved very popular. Yeah. We'll download it. Yeah. Yeah, they're all there just as a range of, a range of PDFs. The website is... Uh, no doubt I'll go on one far too long in a moment. Uh, website's www.riskauthority.co.uk. Um, I've got a, some business cards I can leave on the table, which also have it on. I seem to have lots of other people's business cards as well. Uh, but if you need them there, you know, uh, I'll just leave them on the table. So you work for, you're working for two organizations? Right. Uh, I work for, I'm the tec technical director of the Fire Protection Association. And Risk Authority is the annual, research, uh, annual UK insurer research spend. So they put together, through the membership, they put together about £1 million a year, which uh, I spend on their behalf, so that I always have something fun to do. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but we, we try and focus it very much on uh, deliverables which are appropriate uh, to them and their customers. So typical projects are, are big data projects so that we do all the statistics, GIS projects to help them uh, underwrite and to apply risk control. Uh, and then we also produce many tools for their customers directly uh, to use to help them manage their risks properly. Um, and we also do a lot of political lobbying as well uh, with, with government. Uh, to try and get some sort of appreciation uh, of, of business resilience in there, but it's a very hard struggle uh, for us. Any yeah. questions? Yes? Yeah. Um, and uh, the building standards in, in Holland are the minimum. Yes. It's the lowest level you're allowed to build. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to build a higher standard with. Uh, uh, so that's up to the builder. And the project and developers are only uh, want to spend as less money as they want. Yes. They sit on the, on the bottom. Absolutely right. And it, it, it is. Um, I think it's a, it's a little worse than that because they do try and also dress buildings up to look like they are standard masonry construction. But actually you find the brick layer on the outside is only that thick and underneath it's probably full of polystyrene and timber and everything else that will burn nicely. Um, <laughs> I'll get myself into trouble soon but I think there is an element of disguise and there is an element of uh, Yes, building cheaply, but uh, making everyone believe that these are... That's up to the, to the founder of the building and not to the government to... Uh, build that, that, the that's right. I, yes, I mean, our, our government is trying to reduce legislation and trying to let everyone take informed views. But as a member of the public, you know, when you're looking for houses, you don't generally go th looking at houses with a view to how resilient they are to fire. Um, and things like this, and uh, don't buy it. well, well, yes, yeah, and it's with a housing, or yeah, organic, uh, yes, I think there is, there is a body. I, I, I think probably the discussion needs to be split between the public and dwellings and commercial business. Commercial business managing directors of companies should be a lot more enlightened about their responsibilities and about the choices they can make to make their buildings more resilient. So they can actually request buildings with the extra fire protection in them. I think the problem with the dwelling side of things is often as not we're seeing the most friable structures, light timber frame, being used with unprotected in any way. It's not allowed in the states in that form. They've got a much better record, longer record with light timber frame construction than we have, and they insist on sprinklers if it's over three stories high if it's a house of multiple occupancy, it must be sprinkled. If it's over a certain floor area, it must be sprinkled. In the UK, we've adopted light timber frame construction without any of the safety controls in place. And we're putting people who have absolutely no choice in these buildings. This is the prevalent building uh, <coughs> method for social housing. So people don't have choice. And uh, there's something a little wrong in my mind. The, 
Uh, right. In, I mean, the, the review of statistics uh, that, that, that we did on this, um, and that's, there's a, done a very big study on light timber frame construction, which is on the website if, if you want to look at it. Um, but in the, in the US, yes, in construction, under construction, massive fires, generally a total loss, and that's totally understandable. Once occupied, the highest prevalence of fire is actually in light timber frame construction, but the ones which the only category that they don't sprinkle or protect, and that's the two and three storey single dwellings. All others, the hotels, the businesses, houses of multiple occupancy, they're sprinkled, and their statistics, they just don't feature. Uh, and it's not, a, not an ex accident, I don't think. I yeah. think it's, a little, it's pretty much of politics because if we have a look on the fire safety status on some state home buildings, it's pretty hard to put more pressure to the private sector to have that extra, which is not really uh, interesting. Yeah. I know a case that they, they have been using two classrooms on top of a, of a, of a workshop. Yeah. This was uh, linked out somehow to a cell area for, for young people. It was written in papers that it's illegal to use the classroom, but it needed a fire to yeah. stop using them. So. Okay. Yeah, well, interesting. Right, I think we're probably time to wrap up. Look at everyone grabbing all, <laughs> grabbing all the best biscuits out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Have your, uh... Yes, do. <laughs> do. Excuse me. Uh, yes. My name is John Valio. Um, I'm working for uh, Eva Zen. Maybe you know, uh, do you know Alan Brinson? Yes, I do. I know very well indeed. It's good to meet you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm his colleague. Ah, oh, right, and okay, I'm, good. I'm, I'm uh, representing uh, Yves and here in the Netherlands. Ah, oh, right, okay, excellent. So.